So the first thing I want to say is welcome to L.A. Um, who are the Angelinos in the room? Let's give a shout out for ourselves. Angelinos, we are present. The people who raised their hands, you are the first delegates here because you are the creative placemakers in Los Angeles that will sort of help get everybody acclimated here. Um, it's a, a, a great town. You're at a great time, obviously. Who came from the East Coast? <laughs> um, and um, uh, we're just having a, um, a wonderful, warm time here in our hearts uh, to be able to embrace, and, and outside as well, but, but um, to be able to host um, you guys here. I'm with the Irvine Foundation, by the way. Oh, my name is Josephine Ramirez. Forgot about that, that part. And um, we're, we're just pleased to be the site uh, for this second summit and honored um, and really, really excited about this incredible energy in the room and the potential for some real change starting to happen. Um, Los Angeles as a site and as a concept has always been about this sort of transmutation and change and, um, and I think it's fitting for this conversation that we're gonna have. So um, I won't talk too much more. I just wanted to say welcome and uh, give you a, a warm embrace from your Angel Angelino brethren and um, introduce our uh, fabulous mayor of Los Angeles who has um, made a little video for us to say hello and I think we're gonna um, start with that. Mayor Eric Good Garcetti. Everyone. I'm sorry I can't join you but I want to welcome you to Los Angeles and acknowledge the incredible work done by Art Place, national Art Place grantees and especially our Art Place grantees here in Los Angeles. Art Place is uniquely positioned to advance creative placemaking and support projects that transform neighborhoods and communities using art to create social change. And we're thrilled that they've recognized the work we've done right here in Los Angeles. We're known as the entertainment capital of the world, but I'd also like Los Angeles to be recognized as an arts and culture capital. We're a multicultural city unlike anything else, home to the most diverse, vibrant, and creative people on the face of the planet. And I believe we have the ability to look at arts and cultural placemaking in the 21st century way. One example of this is our Great Streets Initiative. It's a neighborhood scaled approach to one of our largest assets, our city streets, and multidisciplinary teams are working to leverage our existing resources and create community gathering places by bringing together public art, landscaping, small business support, and human scaled street design. I believe in the power of partnership and the power of civic engagement. So I look to you as collaborators and educators to help me shape the Los Angeles of the future. Together, we can transform our communities and build a more vibrant, prosperous, and livable city. Thank you and have a wonderful conference. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I can't join you, but I want to welcome you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Don Liu, Deputy Mayor for the City of Los Angeles. Hi, Mitch. <laughs> I'm pleased to bring greetings from Mayor Garcetti, who's very sorry he can't be here. He's actually on his very first uh, foreign trade mission and, and in Mexico City today but uh, he wanted to take the opportunity to welcome you to Los Angeles by that video. Los Angeles has so many assets at our disposal, our weather, our natural beauty, our infrastructure, our neighborhoods, and our people. Our city has communities such as Lamert Park, Koreatown, Thai Town, Little Armenia, and Boyle Heights that are cultural destinations and part of what makes our city so rich and unique. We are making investments in these communities uh, around transportation infrastructure, which will allow these communities to be more connected and allow those who visit Los Angeles better access to these incredible neighborhoods. One thing the mayor admires about Art Place is its ability to recognize and support projects that tra transform neighborhoods and communities through art and social change. The work that you've done in the field of creative placemaking is phenomenal and a model we hope to replicate as part of our Great Streets Initiative, which the mayor mentioned in, in the video. Streets make up approximately 13% of the land in the city of Los Angeles. That's over 60 square miles, which is roughly the size of both Pittsburgh or St. Louis. 
This, this presents an incredible opportunity to take an asset that we already control and use it as a tool to improve our communities. And we hope to accomplish that through this Great Streets Initiative. This initiative hopes to improve each of LA's diverse neighborhoods, maybe 100 of them throughout the city of LA, by creating a main street with a small street feel, a true sense of community with restaurants, bars, cafes, shops, and galleries, places accessible by car, foot, and traffic. I forgot bike, and I also forgot to mention yoga. <laughs> the mayor is always mentioning yoga. <laughs> he believes that a city that begins with neighborhoods, and a he believes that a city begins with neighborhoods and neighborhoods begin with streets, streets based on walkability, transit, and yoga, and that serve as community hubs. And our mayor has, has emphasized over and over again, he, we do call him uh, a very uh, artistic mayor, the arts and culture mayor, because he is an accomplished jazz pianist and a, and a pretty good photographer too. If you want to follow him on Instagram, at Eric Garcetti, he's taking pictures in Mexico City. Um, he believes that design matters. He believes that our great streets should be a reflection of this, of public art, beautiful benches, distinctive lighting. The way a neighborhood looks and feels has a lot to do with its livability and vibrancy. The re results of all this, focused creative placemaking, busy storefronts offering, offering um, amenities and jobs, closer communities, with increased convenience and bonds between neighbors. And healthier neighborhoods for all of us. So uh, congratulations to the grantees, thank you to the grantors, and welcome to Los Angeles. Have a great conference, thanks. Thank you, Joan. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. We're really proud to have here a leader in the philanthropic field in the whole United States of America. Um, um, someone who I hear from staff is a pretty amazing visual thinker. I don't know if he'll be drawing with his hands up here much, but um, um, Rip Rapson is also the chair of the President's Council for Art Place. This group of leaders of foundations all over the country really have put their, their hearts and their heads together to um, propel this initiative, and with the leadership of Mr. Epson, um, I think maybe we'll all um, grow a little brighter along with them. Rep. Thank you, Josephine, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't know about you, I, I many, many years ago was the deputy mayor in Minneapolis, and to have a mayor with that kind of energy and enthusiasm and vision for um, acts of cr creative activity uh, is just, is just mind-boggling. I, I just dread to think what my mayor would have done if you put him in front of a piano or in front of a, <laughs> of a, of a camera. Um, but it was, it, it was just great to hear all of the ways in which Los Angeles is, is using the creative arts to redefine and, and reimagine its future. It's, it's, it's quite spectacular. I also want to um, thank um, the Kresge staff for showing up. Jamie was a little afraid that we'd have a small crowd, so we invited the Kresge staff to come, and looks like we're at least half of you, so this is great. We've got uh, Alice Carl, who runs our arts program, uh, Helen Johnson in the back, uh, Michelle Johnson is somewhere, uh, Maria Rosario Jackson is, uh, always, is an LA-ish. Oh, no, hello, Michelle? Oh, oh, way back, oh, way back. <laughs> I thought Michelle was looking for more attention, which is, tends to be her want. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and Regina Smith, who is Regina here also. I hope Regina's way in the back. So uh, anything that uh, comes in the next uh, number of minutes that I say um, that is uh, difficult or offensive, please talk to them. Um, <laughs> You know, it's really just such a pleasure to, to be with all of you who have given definition to creative placemaking. Over the course of these next couple of days, uh, we'll ha all have the opportunity to understand the various ways in which this multidimensional, vibrant, and powerful 
movement is shaping communities throughout America. You've all been doing the work that we call creative placemaking for a very long time, but it did receive an indispensable lift almost five years ago when Rocco Landisman took the reins at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I wanted to start with just a little bit of that creation story. Everybody knows Rocco, but if not, he's the guy in the cowboy boots in the front row here. I had the pleasure of getting to know Rocco when I was running the McKnight Foundation in Minneapolis, and he was running the Jujamson Theater Group uh, with the patriarch of the McKnight family, Jim Binger. A couple of things were really clear when Rocco's appointment was announced. First, he would make sure that the White House dress code included cowboy boots. Um, second, he'd bring the same combination of intellectual brilliance and political savvy to Washington that he had displayed in New York. And third, he would not rest until he had reinfused the endowment with the kind of urgent energy and uncompromising vision that the arts and the cultural community so richly deserved. So when he asked me to come and visit his new offices right after he arrived in DC, I pretty much knew he was cooking up something. Uh, when I saw Joan uh, Shikikawa sitting on the sofa in his office, um, it sealed the deal. <laughs> These were serious people with serious ideas. Rocco explained that he wanted to commit the NEA to the proposition that arts and culture could help restore and animate American communities, just as his experiences with historic theaters had suggested, but certainly far more. He asked if I would join with Luis Urbinas and Darren Walker at Ford to help birth that effort. That was a tough choice. Rocco, the most dynamic guy in Washington, and two of the most brilliant people in philanthropy, but I thought I better agree. I suggested that we, we get started by corralling Ann Marcus, and you remember, Rocco, that conversation um, at the University of Minnesota, sort of help us frame the argument, just as she had done for McKnight, incidentally, a number of years ago, and so he and Joan agreed to get that going. And the Marcuson paper confirmed what Rocco already knew. Creative placemaking was thriving across the national landscape, engaging artists in the reimagination and renewal of their communities, elevating community identity and voice in the process of community development. Rocco's next move was to ask Luis and Darren to host a meeting at Ford among a dozen foundations who support the arts to see what role philanthropy and the NEA might play together. When we gathered at the Ford Foundation, and this was the presidents of Mellon and Knight and McKnight, Bloomberg, Serdina, Rockefeller, Irvine, Cargill, William Penn, Rasmussen, and, and, uh, and others, together with Deutsche Bank on behalf of a number of lenders and the NEA staff, the decision to do something mutually supportive probably took all of 17 minutes. And then Darren, in his inimitable um, get to the point style, suggested that we formalize the relationship. Each of our institutions agreed in principle to contribute to an entity that would invest in creative placemaking projects and forge new working relationships with the NEA and its federal partners. That institution formation phase was put into hyperdrive and we had our organization Art Place within a matter of months. Of course, that was far too slow for Rocco, but for the rest of us, it seemed like something out of Star Trek. Um, a number of things were remarkable about all of this. Getting risk-averse institutions to move so quickly to create a new entity, to be sure. But also drawing philanthropy and financial institutions into an unprecedented and complex relationship with the agencies of the federal government. Rocco was clear that his motivation was as much elevating arts and culture on the agenda of every department of the Obama administration as it was directing philanthropic dollars into projects on the ground. And that's exactly what happened during his tenure. Federal departments began integrating arts and culture into their programming and talking to one another about how to do it better. Rocco arranged, for example, just this memorable meeting at the White House uh, for a number of the Art Place presidents and essentially the, the president's entire cabinet. Um, it was just striking how each of the secretaries and presidential advisors had thought about the role of arts in their work, how it could integrate more fully across uh, one another's do, uh, domains and how over time they could make it stick. What Rocco began and the Obama administration has continued is absolutely revolutionary. But it's also ultimately sensible and compelling. Art Place staked out the ground that when you're dealing with a host of seemingly intractable, wickedly difficult problems of our time, arts and culture simply has to be at the center of that conversation. It proposed that you can't smash those problems without the kind of creativity, the kind of energy, the kind of identity perspective that the arts provide. 
When you do infuse the arts, conversations are richer. They're more balanced. They have much more to do with the creative potential of inviting people to examine not only their potential for human development, but also the potential that arts and culture have to drive economic development, to drive sensitive placemaking and attachment to community, and to drive the kind of long-term visioning that a community needs in order to remain vital and healthy. The evidence of that sits in this room. In just a little under three years, Art Place has made over $42 million in grants, contributed to a network of more than 100 creative placemaking projects across the country, and thanks to your creativity, passion, and tenacity, has brought a national spotlight to the idea of creative placemaking. So what defines this work exactly? What is it that tethers all of us here together? Let me suggest just very briefly three characteristics that help explain our work. First, and at the risk of stating the completely obvious, creative placemaking is grounded in the particulars of place. In the community development field, the idea of placemaking has been around for a long time. It pivots on the idea that places are important. Places define us. We attach to a place with an emotional energy and a sense of long-term commitment that is often definitional to how a community works, to how individual identity is formed, and to how, and to how group identity is formed. The particulars of place can be reflected in the rich architectural or historic structures in a community, as we'll see tonight on our walking tour. But a sense of place can also trace to less tangible qualities, deeply rooted cultural traditions, significant historical legacies, or shared lineages of dance, music, language, and other forms of expression. Now, Rocco is fond of likening art to the French concept of toir, which holds that the best wine reflects the unique geography, geology, and microclimate of the area in which the grapes are grown. In the same way, the best art reflects its unique local influences. Creative placemaking accordingly has the potential to do more than embellish a location. It holds the promise of creating an essence, identifying, elevating, or assembling a collection of visual, cultural, social, and environmental qualities that imbue a location with meaning and significance. When we're able to connect to a city or a neighborhood through an individual or shared cultural experience, there's a magnetic pull. You want to stay connected. You want to invest. You want to build a future. And these are the conditions for civic transformation. The second quality of creative placemaking is authentic and ongoing community engagement. Creative placemaking, to be truly successful, is created with and by a community, not to or in spite of it. Community engagement is important, not only because it ensures a voice for residents in shaping the future of their community, but also because it generates social capital, those informal networks of support that bond people one to another and that bridge across difference. The centrality of arts and culture to social cohesion is one of the arts and culture community's secret sauces. Underappreciated and insufficiently understood, this phenomenon has been meticulously documented by the 20-year social impact of the arts research project at the University of Pennsylvania. The, um, the principal investigator there, Mark Stern, writes, it turned out that the arts were associated with preserving ethnic and racial diversity in urban neighborhoods, lower rates of social distress, and reduced rates of ethnic and racial harassment. Perhaps most surprisingly, we found that the pr presence of cultural assets in urban neighborhoods was associated with economic improvements, including declines in poverty. We documented that it was the social and civic engagement associated with the arts that seemed to drive these economic ben benefits and revitalization. It's not simply, then, that the arts promote social well-being. They are indispensable elements of social well-being. Just as you can't strip out health or housing or transportation from social well-being, neither can you remove the arts. And the third quality of creative placemaking is the willingness and the capacity of the arts and cultural sector to assume an outward orientation. You know, for all sorts of understandable and justifiable reasons, the arts and culture community can often be inwardly focused. Part of that's absolutely necessary. There's no substitute for continual cultivation of artistic mission and efficient systems of finance, administration, and artistic mission. But increasingly, that's only part of the puzzle. The fate of cultural institutions and the sector is inextricably intertwined with the face, fate of their host communities. Arts and culture, even if rooted in place and tied to community engagement, will contribute to community revitalization only to the extent 
that they engage private, public, and nonprofit policies, practices, and investments. The arts have to take into account other disciplines, such as the health, the environment, housing, transportation, education, and human services. They have to interact with the financial, governmental, and nonprofit sectors. That will require that the arts and culture sector occasionally leave the safe and secure moorings that our organizations and institutions have come to know. Sometimes we'll pivot just a bit and get it right. At other times, however, we'll have to expand our range of motion to embrace a level of risk and uncertainty commensurate with the magnitude of the challenges we face. But ultimately, a sector that has long stood outside the fence line of major public discussion and decision making looking in will have to get inside and mix it up. Indeed, I would suggest that creative placemaking is a clarion call for a different form of creative engagement, elevating the particulars of place, drawing on community wisdom and energy, embracing the challenges of reconnecting and reinvesting in America's poorest communities, looking beyond one's own institutional walls. Cultural creativity may well be the driving force of community revitalization in the 21st century. It promises more adaptive ways of seeing, understanding, experiencing, and transforming where we live, how we work, and what we dream. You occupy an important part of that creative geography. I know you're committed to making it matter. And keep in mind Martha Graham's admonition. No artist is ahead of her time. She is her time. It's just that the others are behind the time. So, let me then turn, turn to the next phase of Art Place. Uh, many of you had the, the distinct pleasure of working with Carol Coletta. Carol is a force of nature and got us off the ground, crafting a program and creating a national buzz at the ground level. Joe Cartwright is here who worked closely with Carol. They did just spectacular work and, and we're really indebted to you. I also want to thank Jeremy Nowak. Many of you have met Jeremy. There is really no one quite like Jeremy. Um, he took Art Place through its transition phase, and he just is one of those rare, sort of superb analytical thinkers who can both be creative and uh, methodical at the same time, and he really helped us bridge to where we now are. And finally, I want to thank each Art Place grantee for your incredibly important work and your contribution to advancing this, this movement. Um, but our work is not done, and the very good news is that if you had to look across the American landscape and identify one person who was uniquely qualified to take us into the future, which is exactly what we did, um, you'd land on Jamie Bennett. Uh, Jamie probably needs no introduction to this room, but uh, let me torture him just a little bit and, um, and introduce him nevertheless. Um, Jamie, as you probably know, was the Director of Public Affairs at the NEA um, starting in 2009, and he was promoted as well to serve as the Chief of Staff in June 2011. Prior to the NEA, he was the Chief of Staff at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, serving as a senior member of the Commissioner's leadership team, and he was the Chief of Staff in the office of the President of Columbia University. Um, there is a whole string of other things that I'm not going to walk you through, but let me just uh, say that when we were interviewing, I had never met Jamie. I had heard about Jamie. Rocco had told me all sorts of stories about this, this phenom. Um, and it was very interesting because a guy had sort of appeared um, uh, in our interview list out of my background who was just spectacular, and I couldn't imagine anyone even holding a candle to this, to this other candidate, and then Jamie walked in the room. And I don't think I have ever seen anyone as deeply passionate about, um, thoughtful about, um, and able to express in these sort of wondrous, sort of irreverent and yet elegant uh, phrases the importance of arts and culture to our, our daily life. Uh, I think we are just unbelievably blessed to have Jamie at the helm of Art Place. I know that in many ways, so much of our success just depends on, on the work you do, but you gotta have someone sort of at the center um, trying to make sense out of it, trying to create some platforms, trying to create some of the connective tissue that I think will make this movement stronger. And so it's been my pleasure to work with Jamie all of, what, two months. Um, and in those two months, um, he's already, um, in my mind, justified our decision many times over. So I'm delighted to introduce to you the the head of Art Place, Jamie Bennett. Uh, 
Um, thank you so much, Rip. Uh, I think it, it really means a lot to me to have you read that introduction that my mother wrote, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, but in all seriousness, um, as I was sort of considering this opportunity, the chance to work with Rip and with all of his colleagues at Kresge, as he pointed out, many of whom are here, was really one of the big driving points for that. Um, in the two months that we've gotten to work together in this way, I've already learned so much about what it really means to care about a place, to care about it deeply, to care about it in locally nuanced ways, and, and to care about the people who make it up. So I'm already deeply indebted uh, to the Kresge Foundation. And in addition to getting to have Rip as our chair of the President's Council, uh, I also have his colleague, Alice Carl, who um, co-chairs the Operations Committee along with Judy Lee Reed, who I think did make it in from New York, yes? Yes, hi Judy Lee, welcome. Uh, made it out of the storms from the east, uh, from the Cerdna Foundation. And in addition to the Kresge team and, and uh, Judy Lee, we have people here from 10 of the foundations uh, that are partners in Art Place. So I hope over the next three days you'll all take some time and get to know our colleagues from the Barr Foundation, which is the most recent partner to join the Art Place family, which we're thrilled about. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Ford, Irvine, thank you again, Josephine, for everything you and your colleagues have done uh, in making the next three days possible. Uh, the Knight Foundation, Rip and Alice's colleagues at Kresge. Mick Knight, we have a colleague from Mellon who's on her way. I think she's in Charlotte at the moment, trying to get here um, to LA, Rasmussen. And uh, I think Julie has at least one other colleague here from Cerdna as well. So please really do take the opportunity over the next days to get to know them. Um, I also want to point out another partner uh, who will be largely invisible to a lot of you guys, but will play a really important role to us, which are we have colleagues from Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors with us who are going to be new partners to Art Place in terms of managing our operations, and I'm really excited to be working with them, as well as our colleagues at, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I saw Chris Beck registering earlier. Hey, Chris. Uh, as well as a number of colleagues here from the National Endowment for the Art. And I have the distinct... I don't know that I would call it an honor. I have the distinct situation of having um, two of my former NEA bosses in the house. So we have both Rocco Landisman, who along with his wife Debbie have been tremendous friends and colleagues, as well as Joan Chigakawa, uh, who's currently heading up the agency um, and doing just a fantastic job uh, along the way with that. So I just want to add my thanks as we're doing sort of the formal bit of this uh, to Mayor Garcetti and the City of Los Angeles for their help and partnership, the Deputy Mayor for joining us today, Abigail Marquez, who will, uh, the Associate Director of Education Workforce, who will join us tomorrow, and most importantly, our colleagues from the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, who've really been extraordinary partners in putting this together. So Rip talked a little bit about the founding of Art Place, and he mentioned the two people that I would like to sort of publicly go on record uh, with my thanks and acknowledge the deep debt that I owe to Carol Coletta, our founding director, and Jeremy Nowak, who served as the interim director during our strategic planning process. It was a strategic planning process that brings us to where we are today, to this gathering, and to these opening remarks. So all of us gathered in person together here in Los Angeles represent everything that we have collectively accomplished over Art Place's first three years. You are the grantees that have been doing the hard work, the foundation partners that have provided the capital we were able to invest in this work, our government colleagues from whom we learned so much, and the readers and panelists who helped us review and adjudicate the thousands, thousands of LOIs and applications that we've received. And we also have a number of people who are watching this webcast via HowlRound TV and participate, participating in the online discussion on Twitter using the hashtag ArtPlace. And in many ways, those people, our virtual colleagues, represent the future of ArtPlace because they're the individuals, the projects, and the organizations that we've not yet had a chance to work with directly. So I just want to add a special thank you to everyone and a welcome to everyone who's watching us online. So last week, as hopefully all of you saw on the eve of this summit, we announced the 97 projects that will be considered as finalists for Art Place investment in 2014. It's a wonderful list that represents the creative placemaking work across the country. We have projects in every region of the country, in almost every artistic discipline, in every size of community, and it's a list that makes me incredibly proud. But I do want to talk for a minute about the other LOIs we received. There are nearly 1,200 projects that ArtPlace will not get to know more closely through this year's application process. 
And the reason I bring this up is because those are the projects that in some ways so deeply informed the strategic planning process that the foundations undertook. As Rip said, over the past three years, we've invested over $42 million in 134 projects taking place in 80 communities around this country. But it's clear from those 1,200 LOIs that were not invited to submit full proposals that $42 million in investment represents an investment in just the very tip of creative placemaking that's happening in this country. And our foundation partners realized that we were interested both in the projects in which we were able to invest and also in the ones that we've not yet reached. And what they realized ultimately is that they were not interested in art place as an organization per se, but what they really were interested in was the field of creative placemaking. Our partners confirmed that rather than being interested in building a permanent institution, they wanted, the creative place, they wanted to make creative placemaking a standard operating procedure throughout the country. As Rip said, the work itself is not at all new. The arts have been actively shaping place throughout recorded history. I did a recent blog post and I pointed to the theaters in ancient Greece as an early example of a situation where you had a theater as the literal, spiritual, and civic center of a community. And in response, someone emailed me and suggested I go back even further and consider the caves of Lascaux as perhaps the earliest example of art inscribing place in a meaningful way. So I think it's safe to say that even though the work is ancient, as Rip said, the word itself is new. And if something is yet to be named, it is also yet to become a field of practice. When Carol Coletta arrived at Art Place three years ago, creative placemaking as a phrase existed at best inside air quotes. It was always creative placemaking. And among Carol's extraordinary accomplishments, the one I find most breathtaking is how quickly she got rid of the air quotes and turned creative placemaking into a thing. One of the ways she did this was by being absolutely laser-like in her focus. She defined creative placemaking's theory of change as partnerships between the arts and their communities that were aimed at driving vibrancy as defined by changes in people, activity, and value. Vibrancy, in turn, would increase the quality of place. Quality of place would help with talent attraction and retention. And that talent, those people, would lead to place-based economic development and community prosperity. Often in philanthropic initiatives, people will work hard at creating a theory of change that clear and robust. But then when it comes time to actually making the investments, to making the grants, too often only a narrow sliver of that theory ever gets illuminated. Stunningly, Carol succeeded at just the opposite. Looking around this room, looking at the projects that you all represent, I see things that are collectively even more interesting than our original theory of change. Many of you are driving vibrancy. Some of you are even doing that as your primary objective. But others of you are doing other things, valuable things, things that we need to also explicitly recognize in art places work. Because of Carol's success in getting creative placemaking into the national lexicon, we're actually now able to evolve into the next phase of art places mission. When I had those conversations with the Art Place Search Committee, they told me that they were interested in catalyzing, strengthening, and supporting a national movement around creative placemaking. They wanted to make it standard operating procedure that every mayor, every county executive, every tribal leader in this country would see the arts as a core sector of their community, at the table right alongside housing, transportation, public safety, and education as a sector that is crucial to the future of a community. It, would, it should be a sector that both needs planning and investment to succeed, and also one that contributes mightily to its community's future. Oh, and the foundations were also gracious in telling me I had seven years to get that done. <laughs> so our foundation partners changed the unit of analysis for Art Place's success from the portfolio of projects in which we are investing to the field of creative placemaking in this country. This pivot from being a collection of projects to being one organization in a field of endeavor is a theme that we've woven into our time together over the coming days. 
Following this session, our colleagues from Arts Emerson and HowlRound in Boston, Massachusetts, will share with us the Commons framework that they use to describe their work as part of the American theater broadly writ. Tomorrow, uh, interim president and CEO of the Irvine Foundation, Don Howard, will lead us through the strong field framework that he developed and that Irvine has adopted in some of its work in poverty eradication, public education, and other areas. And then we'll end our time together collectively, those of us in this room, in the same town hall format that Carol used to conclude last year's session in Miami, where we will collectively chart out the work, of the work that is ahead of us all. In order for any of those frameworks to fit, it's important that we have clarity in the definition of ourselves as a field. So I have proposed that we expand the definition of creative placemaking to encompass all of the work in which the arts play an explicit and central role in strategies that are shaping the social, physical, and economic future of their communities. I've spent much of my time over the past two months trying out this definition on various colleagues. And we recently had a meeting with um, some of our colleagues from National Arts Strategies and their CEO, a wonderful woman named Russell Willis-Taylor, who I know some of you know, sort of stopped me halfway through the spiel and said, oh, I get it. Creative's an adverb, not an adjective. It's the making that is creative. And I think that's exactly right. And it also allowed me to offer what is perhaps an even more elegant definition for creative placemaking. In creative placemaking, we're doing art to change place. Art Place's Deputy Director, Liz Crane, will lead a session tomorrow that talks about intentions and outcomes and seeks to demystify the whole evaluation conversation by breaking it down into three questions. What are you going to do? What are you trying to change? And how are you going to know if you did it? I want to pause here and make explicit what I hope has been implicit in Art Place from the beginning. Not all art should be dedicated to creative placemaking. There are plenty of artists and artworks that are not interested in changing place. Some care about individual transformation. Others serve as an idiosyncratic expression of a thought or image that has never before existed. But because of Art Place's success in igniting the creative placemaking movement in this country, I have heard grumpiness from some arts colleagues who are not interested in this work as their primary mission, and they're feeling pressure to get into it. Well, I believe that every community needs to incorporate the arts and creative placemaking into community planning and development, just as every community works with housing and transportation. I do not believe that every artist and work of art needs to be dedicated to this work. But any artist, arts project, or arts organization that is explicitly interested in playing a role in shaping its community's future, Art Place stands ready to accept and welcome as colleagues in our collective field of creative placemaking. So what exactly is Art Place going to be doing between now and the sunset date that I've been given of 2020? Our goal is to deeply embed creative placemaking throughout the community development and planning field to make sure that arts organizations feel both welcome at and a responsibility to all conversations about their community's futures. And then to make what my friends Pat, Patrick, and Maggie affectionately refer to as an Irish goodbye. Our goal will be to slip away quietly while the party is in full swing with no one even noticing. <laughs> so how do we hope to do that? There are four broad areas of work I see before us. The first will be Art Place's signature program, the national grant making. Art Place will continue to make grants across the country through an open call for proposals to support creative placemaking projects. And we will continue to make those investments guided by peer readers and panelists from both the arts world and the place world. We want to invest in bold and exciting projects, ones that are likely to be deeply transformative, and some that have the potential to fail spectacularly. Some should come from usual suspects, others should come from organizations that have never before received philanthropic support. But, and this is an important change, we're going to ask something new of our grantees going forward. We're going to ask them to, yes, be responsible for their projects, Yes, they will still have responsibility for the organizations they represent. But we're also going to ask them to join us in shouldering some of the responsibility for the broad field of creative placemaking. In, some, in, in philanthropy, some grantees are thought of as winners. There's rhetoric around competitions and being awarded a grant. 
Other grantees are thought of almost as contractors. A funder identifies an area of work in which it wants to make a vision and essentially outsources that vision, hiring a nonprofit to end hunger or strengthen public education. Still other grantees are thought of as partners, a co-equal who joins a funder around a shared interest and who brings different resources to bear on the challenge. At Art Place, we're hoping to sketch out a fourth way forward. Grantees, we're going to think of as delegates from the field of creative placemaking. Delegates who represent different geographies, different size of communities, artistic disciplines, types of communities, types of partnerships, and so on. And these delegates, we're gonna to ask to be responsible for representing their sector within the national conversation, and also for carrying back information and resources from the national conversation to their sector. This can be a scary ask. Carrying out a project takes a lot of commitment. Being the caretaker of an organization has a lot of demands that come with it. There are gonna be some organizations who may not feel up to also taking on some responsibility for the field as a whole. However, for those who are interested and willing, I believe that we will discover that once we expand our field of vision to the field as a whole, new opportunities and resources will be open to us. Our colleagues from HowlRound who are gonna lead the next session often use the frame of needing to move from scarcity to abundance. Rather than leading with what we lack, we want to do something but we don't have the money to do it, we need to lead with what we bring to the table. We need to strike a stance that's more, let me show you what I can do for you. In an email I had with Rocco over the weekend, he sort of summed it all up by saying, yep, we need to see artists as givers, not takers. And I think that's exactly right. David and Polly from HowlRound will lead us through an exercise that will help us collectively to identify what resources we have as a field and what are the resources we've not yet identified. On Tuesday morning, Don Howard from Irvine will lead us through an exercise to look at where we are specifically around the issue of leadership and pipeline. So who are the leaders in creative placemaking and who are the next generation of leaders? And also where we are with developing and sharing standards of practice. Please keep this notion of grantee delegate in mind as we go through both of those sessions, as well as through everything we do together, because this is a topic that I'm very eager to have your feedback about, as it will inform our guidelines and our review process for 2015 and beyond. So, we're gonna continue with our national grant making with this added goal of seating a Congress of delegates from the creative placemaking field with a special emphasis on the sectors of the field that are currently underrepresented. But number two, we're gonna add a new stream of investment. We will be looking to identify five communities across the country in which we will make a deep and sustained commitment. The five communities will be in different regions of the country. They'll cover all size of community with something like two being urban, two being rural, the fifth being an isolated metropolitan area or suburban area. We'll be looking for communities where there's lots of potential to see creative placemaking in action, and we will use those communities as showcases and laboratories from which other communities around the country can learn. We will use those communities as the sites to activate our work with Art Place's financial partners and see how other kinds of capital, debt, lines of credit, et cetera, can help further creative placemaking. We'll also use these communities to see the different ways that it is possible to leverage the policies and resources of the federal government. Tomorrow, we'll see presentations from the Promise Zone work here in Los Angeles, as well as some of the work that the USDA is supporting through the International Sonoran Desert Alliance in Ajo, Arizona. Both of these are federal programs that are locally deployed. And I think once we have these five local laboratories, it will provide a really important experience and learning opportunity for us in terms of how to engage most effectively with those federal programs. We've not yet decided how those communities will be chosen, and we're currently in conversations about the different ways we might do that. Some of the funds that we've uh, previously used for national grant making will be focused on these communities. So we'll be seeing both of these buckets of grant making as Art Place's direct investments in creative placemaking projects that transform community. So the third area of work will be around our research strategy. 
and Joe Courtright was introduced before from Impressa Consulting, and as Rip said, Joe's been an invaluable research partner for ArtPlace over the past three years, and Joe will very much continue to work closely with us. But we also need many more Joes. We need a Congress of researchers who will ask all of the questions that need to be asked of artistic interventions and community outcomes. We need economists, we need community planners, we need anthropologists, we need geographers, we need big data people, and we need the anecdotal. Our place will not directly get into the business of publishing research ourselves. Instead, we will commission research and support research that will live elsewhere. This is both because we need the research to live in institutions that will last well beyond 2020, and also because we want to support all lines of inquiry into this work. Around research, we'll have essentially three different areas of endeavor. Our place will work as something of a librarian, uh, getting literate in all the relevant areas of knowledge and having enough fluency to connect people with the existing work that can help illuminate and further their own projects. Art Place will also serve as a venture capitalist for research, investing in new avenues of inquiry, encouraging and supporting research projects that are almost at a tipping point, and importantly, funding bridging work that will help connect extant areas of knowledge that do not currently speak to one another. As just one example, I am making a public vow that I will never again sit through a meeting where the quantitative people and the qualitative people explain how the other is wrong. We need both. If you, if you actually succeed in getting qualitative work that illuminates quantitative data, you can actually begin to see the big picture. So bringing kinds of knowledge together is an area that we want to invest a lot of time and intention. And as part of that, we'll also be working as a convener. We'll be bringing together researchers to talk about creative placemaking. We will help researchers attend conferences that are outside their usual sphere. We will bring together researchers with practitioners and policymakers. I have no interest in investing in research that's going to sit on a shelf in the academy. I'm interested in research that will help shape work in real time. Work that will help us understand where we're succeeding and work that will allow us to ask what we should be doing differently. So in addition to our national grant making, our place-based community investments, and our research strategy, our place will also be looking to undertake a bucket of work around field building. We will look to make investments in the infrastructure that we need to operate as a field. Um, let me use as an example of field infrastructure HowlRound TV, through which people around the country are able to watch our summit. For a relatively modest investment, I think HowlRound has a contract of something like $5,000 a year, and for a portion of one of their staff members' time, thank you, Vijay, very much for the work you're doing, uh, HowlRound is able to offer a high-quality ad-free platform to the entire theater community to be able to broadcast performances, discussions, conferences, and panels. Because we in creative placemaking are also a national field, I think something like this would be an invaluable resource for us. While virtual is by no means an exact substitute for in-person, Given the time and resource commitments that travel entails, having this as an option, especially for the colleagues who do not live and work near a major airport hub, is a really important option that I think we should offer the field. Our blog at artplaceamerica.org has been an extraordinary resource for broadcasting information about each of the projects that you all are doing. And I would like to build on that wealth of information and turn our blog into an online platform where discussions about and among the whole field of creative placemaking in this country can take place. We want to help allow our grantee delegates to attend conferences, help them make national presentations. We want to allow you all to be resources to your peers around this country. The field building work will be in some ways most important to our goal of sunsetting in 2020 as this will be what allows us to help connect the field in ways that will outlive us as an organization. So how are we going to get this done? As some of you know, despite the smoke and mirrors, at the moment, Art Place is just two of us. Myself and our absolutely extraordinary deputy director, Liz Crane, who I think is perched in the back. <laughs> So I think, as is clear from that spontaneous reaction, uh, Liz is perhaps the one person in this room that we all have in common. So in preparing for the summit, in managing your grants, I think Liz has talked with and emailed each of you on decidedly more than one occasion. 
So each of us individually only knows a tiny sliver of all that Liz has done for Art Place, and I think if we were ever to piece it together, we would truly be undone by all that she's accomplished in the past year and a half. But the good news for Liz is that when we return to New York after this conference, uh, we will at long last have all of the pieces in place that will allow us to hire some new colleagues at Art Place. So we'll shortly be posting four position descriptions. Someone to run our national grant making program, which I think quite possibly could be the best job in this country. Someone to be our director of research strategies, which I think easily could be the most interesting job in this country. And a director of communications who will be charged with leading our field building work. And I'll be honest here, I think that clearly is the worst job in this country <laughs> because I care a great deal about that work and unfortunately I think I know something about it. So there's not enough money in the world to get me to be my own director of communications. So good luck to whoever responds to that. Um, in addition to that, we'll also be hiring an operations manager who will interface with our colleagues at Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, and that will actually be a fascinating opportunity for someone to have a look into the way that a really first-rate organization is run, RPA, as well as see the nuances and, and uh, individual natures of the 14 foundations that we have as our partners. So I actually think that's a really interesting one as well, and I hope that you all will be on the lookout for those postings and help us distribute them widely. So, Here's where I come to, a, to an end of my prepared comments, and I want to end this with a thank you, as Rip did, to everyone in the room. One of the sort of most humbling things about this job is looking around this room and being reminded so concretely of the fact that I'm not the one who's doing any of the hard work. That hard work is being done by all of you, and that it's really the people in this room that I'm looking at who've built this field of creative placemaking to what it is today. So I'm eager and excited to offer whatever assistance I can to moving your work forward. So I want to end my, my uh, comments here. I've sketched out a little bit about what our trajectory is going to be for the next seven years. And in the balance of the time that we have left, I'd really love to open this up to conversation, to questions, to discussions, um, and really just sort of take the next 20 or 30 minutes to get to know each other a little bit better and um, you know, tease apart any place where there's any confusion. We've got a couple mics that are running around, Liz, and we've got another one here in the center um, and on the side. And I just ask that you do please ask your question into a mic for the folks who are watching us online, otherwise they can't hear it. So let me end what I have there and be quiet for a moment and, and hear from someone who's out there. Stunned silence. <laughs> Thank you. Julia Taylor from Milwaukee. And I love the idea about creating a school of thought around creative placemaking because I think it is something different in everyone's mind, which isn't a bad thing. But it would be good if we could start to explain better, I think, to the public sector as well as the private sector about the impact this could have to us in terms of how our communities are going to look years from now. So thank you for taking it that direction. That's great. Thank you so much. Chris Beck. Chris Beck with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, Jamie and I were on a phone call last week preparing for our session on Monday, so we may get into this tomorrow. But I said something on the phone call that struck me in my head and thought about before, but I thought I'd just share it. And um, I started thinking about um, the, I've been involved a little bit with the, the STEM to STEAM conversation, do you all know what I'm talking about? Science, technology, engineering, and math, and the arts, people want to add art. I think that's great, and we should be trying to integrate arts into education. And I started thinking about, well, what we're trying to do here is integrate arts into the land use and transportation community development intersection. And I think that this movement, this field of practice, is, is, is similar to the STEM STEAM I don't know what the acronym would be in <laughs> community development, but that's how I've, I've been thinking about that and it's resonating in my head that that is in part what we're trying to do. You alluded to it in your own words, but I, I, I think that's something we can be, that's a seed I'd plant with all of you as well. I love that. And just for those of you who haven't yet met Chris, um, he and his colleagues at USDA have been some of our closest colleagues 
um, both at, at Art Place in terms of the creative placemaking work, but also at the National Endowment for the Arts. And it's one of the things that I just think is wonderful because it would be very easy for the USDA to sort of define their mission in a way that had nothing to do with the arts and sort of say, we don't need to enter into those conversations. But instead, at least over the past six years of this administration, they've really been some of the most embracing. And I know a number of folks in this room have gotten to work with Chris and his colleagues, so I love that. So I think, do we have someone down front? Yeah, hi. Um, is this on? OK, great. Um, I'm Megan Tracy, and I'm with Arts at the Feeding Grain in Loveland, Colorado. And um, I'm so excited. I'm very pleased to be in this room with all of you. But I think one of the things that Art Place really did for us, and all of us sitting in this first row here, um, were the first Colorado recipients of this grant. And um, we all have collectively now um, thought of ways of, that we can collaborate in our state, which is really exciting. And I can see that happening on a national level just by being here. So thank you. That's fabulous. And I'm especially thrilled that the front row is here since I was snowed out of my trip to Denver uh, for the Smart Growth Conference. So I owe you all one. So I will be seeing you in Colorado soon. Sounds They good. have it on camera. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, my name is Nancy Halpern Ibrahim from um, our beloved place of South Los Angeles. We will have the honor of hosting you tomorrow night at tomorrow night's mixer at the Mercado La Paloma. And one of the things that um, moved me very much in your remarks, um, Esperanza is a 25-year-old organization that has had a mission of human rights exercised through five main domains, so housing, affordable housing, health, economic development, education, and arts and culture. And while we have always gotten tremendous kudos for keeping the arts as fundamental to our mission and to exactly an, an essential element in cultivating healthy communities from the grassroots up, um, we had not, until the Art Place funding, ever been funded for that kind of work. And so I want to stand in appreciation of having been so designated before. I'm looking forward to having discussions with all of you tomorrow <coughs> in our beloved place at the Mercado La Paloma, which in fact had been until the 13 years ago when we started to develop the site, a garment sweatshop, like so many other spaces in that immediate environment. So I want to really appreciate um, hearing from this podium and among these colleagues how essential in all of the work we do, whether it's in economic development, whether it's in um, health promotion and building community health leaders, or quality affordable housing at every level of affordability for families in this nation, that the arts are uh, just an essential, an essential component of that and the support that this, um, that Art Place has given to neighborhoods like ours is really profound, as we look forward to showing you tomorrow night. That's fabulous. Tomorrow Thank night's going to be fabulous. So I know that there's always creep in terms of, you know, as a conference goes on, don't miss tomorrow night's party, really. <laughs> Jamie, uh, is this on? Can you yep. hear me? Mm -hmm. First of all, I just want to start with a thank you. I am, first of all, congratulations. We're so happy that you're at the helm. You're going to do a great job. And I want to thank all of the Art Place um, funders. Everybody that's made this investment, it has really done extraordinary things for our communities. So thank you so much. And also, you have really catalyzed a movement within this nation. Um, and then also, it's had this incredible reverberating effect. About two weeks ago, I had the honor of testifying at uh, the California Joint Committee on the Arts. And I talked about the role of creative placemaking in economic development. And I highlighted two of our art place funded projects. Excellent. And as a result of that um, testimony, that hearing, there was new legislation that was introduced to restore funding to the California Arts Council. So that's just part of the story that you've done, that you've created here with Art Place. So thank you so much. I really want to just say that from the bottom of my heart as a professional, as also as somebody that's, you know, in the trenches in San Jose. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to go ahead and be bold, and I'm going to ask the $90 million yeah. question. How do you become one of those five communities? Yeah, so this is, no, 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 I, I love any question. At this point, this, is, this um, is both convenient, but it also happens to be true. We honestly don't know yet. Um, there are a bunch of different ways that we might think about approaching this. 
I'm really committed to there being five different regions of the country represented. I don't want them all five clustered in the west or all five clustered in the southeast or something like that. I really am committed to there being five different sizes of communities so that we're looking at both creative placemaking in the rural setting as well as in the urban setting. Um, I think there's some interesting things going on with suburban communities that we saw through the most recent thing. So on one hand, I would sort of love to do an open national competition, but on the other hand, it's a little difficult to balance that along with sort of the requirements for balancing the portfolio. So the good news is we honestly don't know. So you guys probably have a good six weeks to begin lobbying us for how we should go about <laughs> selecting those communities. So there is not yet a secret plan. Um, and if it makes you feel any better, I was meeting with one of our fabulous foundation partners um, uh, in Philadelphia a couple weeks ago who asked the very same question. Uh, and so I gave them the very same answer. So that really is the truth at the moment. So yes, and I actually, that just reminds me, I don't know if I mentioned Olive Mosher from William Penn, who's here. Um, but William Penn, if I didn't give you a shout out before, William Penn is here as well. Sarah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Kimberly Van Dyke from Wilson, North Carolina with the Wallace Simpson Whirligig Park Project. Um, and um, I, I liked what you said about embedding creative placemaking in planning, transportation, and community development. But I think it's really critical that we also add economic development to that list. I can tell you that with our project, over the last year, what we have seen is significant economic reinvestment in the geographic area surrounding our project um, to the tune of $20 million. Now, that may not seem like a lot, depending on where you're from, but if you're from a small, rural, formerly tobacco-dependent town in North Carolina with a uh, very depressed downtown, that is phenomenal, going from almost zero to $20 million in one year of property redevelopment, business creation, and job creation. So I think that we should add economic development to the list. I think that's great. And just before you sit down, will you just say a couple words about what the project is for the folks in the room who may not know it? Just because I think this is such a neat and unexpected example of the fact that this project would lead to such a strong economic development case. Sure. So um, the project is in the middle of a, of a downtown that's very economically depressed. Um, in a small town, like I mentioned, in North Carolina, the population's 50,000. And um, there was an artist, he actually just passed away in May, he was 94, and he created giant kinetic wind-powered sculptures. And they were in a field sort of outside of town. Um, long story short, about three years ago, the community galvanized around acquiring those pieces of art that were in severe disrepair. Um, and, um, and repairing and conserving th all of them, there are 31 of them, they're, they're massive and gigantic, like 50 feet tall and, and you know, three tons. Um, and they're building a world-class sculpture park in downtown Wilson, so I hope you can all come see it. We're, uh, we're about three quarters of the way through with the project, and, and what we have to do now is just, um, is just construct it. So we're almost done, but it has, I mean, it has not only transformed sort of really the whole community perception of itself, um, but also has really driven investment in the downtown. Of course, we have a long way to go, um, but it's a, it's a phenomenal start. And the works of art themselves are just so whimsical and so magical. And so, Anyway, it's just, I, I sort of love the look of it. Let me come here and then I know we've got in the middle. Yeah. Um, Eric Abner from uh, the Hale Foundation, Cincinnati. Um, I, I just, um, it's kind of fun to be here both as sort of a grantee, because we, we work with the Cosine Project in Cincinnati, but actually, we're a regional funder right. um, who just focuses on one region. And it may be something to consider in this field of work and especially even these, these communities of sustained focus is how to leverage a local or a regional funder in that. So that instead of having five, maybe there's a way to, to sort of um, bring regional funders who are always going to be in that place, um, not just for five years or for seven years, but is there a way to leverage our presence in those communities to so then maybe you have 30 of those communities of, of focus? Um, or let's maybe start with 10. But, you, but I think there is, there's a willingness from the regional funder community, I think specifically the private funders, who would be saying, we, we would love to be an art place funder, but we kind of already are in our own community. So I think there's an interesting conversation to be had about how do you leverage that to achieve the, this really great direction you guys so are gonna think about. I think hundred percent. And one of the things that I'll sort of say explicitly to sort of foundation and, and funder colleagues, 
there's nothing in my job that asks me to increase the number of funders who have money throwing, flowing through art place. That's not how my success is going to be measured. So if I can work with regional foundations, we've had an interesting conversation with some leaders in community foundations around the country, and share our way of working. If we did end up running a national or regional competition to get cities to compete, and we could share those applications with regional funders who might want to invest in other projects, I love that. So I don't need, just to be absolutely clear, I don't need anyone to sort of come on and formally join the Art Place party. I'm happy to sort of bring the party to you, you know, party in a box, um, set it up and, and go nuts. So I love that idea, and I've already tapped you to do one thing over the next couple of days, and I think I'm going to be emailing you to set up a phone call to keep doing it. So, and the Cosign Project is, I mean, I'm going to say this about every project, the Cosign Project's another great sort of whimsical, fun project. So I know we have someone here. Hi. Or there's a mic, oh, sorry, behind you. And then we have a gentleman. Hi, um, I'm Nancy Barton from the Prattsville Art Project. And um, I just want to thank you guys, like everybody else, because I never would have gotten so involved with my community if it hadn't been for Art Place. When we you know, sent in that grant and we heard that Liz was coming for a site visit, the whole town was like, you're kidding. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I'm in a town of 700 people that was destroyed by Hurricane Irene, and virtually, you know, the entire town is like, you know, wiped off the face of the map. And I just wanted to say how much it means to have art tied into things like disaster recovery. That's another whole infrastructure mm -hmm. that um, I think is really worth considering since we have all this climate problem. Um, and also, I wanted to say that. It is really special to work among people who do not believe that art has anything for them. Um, you know, the people in rural America who have like pickup trucks and guns, those are the people I talk to every day. And the, like the bikers are afraid to come into the art center. So my, you know, like sunset opportunity is get the bikers in the door. Um, and I think that's a conversation that's really important for America politically, you know, the kind of split between liberals and conservatives is really a split about fear. It's really about people who don't know something because they've never seen it. And so putting art in these places that have never had it before has just been extraordinary. I think that's great. And I want to make sure, if you don't know, will our Milwaukee friends raise their hands? I just want to make sure that you connect with these guys because Milwaukee, their creative community fascinates me because Harley Davidson is every bit as much a part of it as the museum is. And so I just think if that's something you're looking to do, here are two people who might have some, some knowledge to share in a really interesting way. Can we go here? Great, and then I'll come over here. Next. Yeah, please. Hi, everyone. My name's Rod France. I'm with uh, Create Here Now from the state of Connecticut. And uh, I'm just buzzing from being in this group today. The energy level, at least in my antenna, is just off the charts. And uh, I want to congratulate you, Jamie. I, I heard your remarks and Rip's remarks before that, and uh, they were really stunning. And uh, I applaud the direction you're taking the organization in. Uh, I have the good fortune to be here with my partner, Margaret Bodell, today, and we both work for uh, a very visionary civil servant named Kip Bergstrom in uh, the state of Connecticut. Kip is the uh, Deputy Director of Economic Development, and under his umbrella is uh, the Office of the Arts, uh, the Office of Innovation, Historic Preservation, and... Uh, tourism. And so what KIPP has done very, very gradually, because it's sort of like turning a, a ocean liner, is bring all of these departments into alignment with creative placemaking uh, for the, the purpose of uh, economic development. And he uh, has started, uh, the Historic Preservation Office has uh, started a grant called Historic Preservation Arts Catalyzed Placemaking, and Margaret and I uh, worked on the first iteration of that grant. So what we're doing now is, is leveraging historic preservation monies to uh, repurpose historic buildings as uh, creative placemaking centers, and we're doing this uh, all around the state. So uh, I, I, I invite you to uh, uh, you know meet with Kip or talk with Kip sometime. I'd be happy to make that introduction. I would and, love that. Uh, I got to know him a little bit when I was at the NEA, and he and Rocco got to know each other. That's but right. I haven't that's reconnected right. with him in this hat, so I would welcome but that. It's Thank so great to much. be here today. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. I think over house right. 
Hi, uh, my name is Nato Thompson. I'm with Creative Time. It's yeah. really great to be here. I'm really excited. Um, I think it's about time that we had a moment where culture and the production of the city is taken as a given because I think actually that knowledge has been going on, but it's like everyone's getting their head around it. It's exciting because it's the facts. In some ways, too, it feels like the arts since the culture wars have been trying to get their legs underneath them as a way to defend themselves to America. And in the CIA, they have a term called blowback where you become victim to the kind of boosterism that you perpetuate. And I think in the arts, we gotta be careful that we don't hitch our ride to revitalization without parsing out the social justice issues within that. And I think like it, there's a race class dimension in this that is really delicate and, and really important because I think to maintain our base and actually keep it real, we can't just always be so rah rah because the arts actually are being used by all kinds of forces, good, bad, whatever, to change cities for various reasons, for various forms of power. So I think for us, it's a, it's a call, because the artists, I think, at the end of the day, want to keep it real and keep social justice on the table. And so I think we got to owe it to each other to be really careful. And I'm looking forward to the kind of research you're talking about, and how we can split these questions up about placemaking, so we can make sure that when we do it, we really help cities for the people that need it most. No, I think that's very important. I just, I think that's hugely important, and tomorrow uh, afternoon we'll hear from two colleagues, Manuel Pastor and Tom Main, and both of them sort of approach places as collections of people. And I think one of the things that's an interesting thing to me about this, about sort of coming into the creative placemaking space, is that there's something in the language we use around placemaking that talks about place almost as if it's empty of people. And for placemaking, in terms of how I talk about it, and I think how all you live and experience and work in it, places are the collections of people who are in them, right? I mean, place is people in a lot of ways for the work we're doing. So I just, I think this is a really important conversation. It's one that I hope tomorrow afternoon will spark some um, conversation about, but I hope we'll sort of have it as a thread through everything. So thank you, Nato. Sarah, yes. Hi, I'm Anne-Marie Erickson, and very happily here from Detroit and the Detroit Institute of Arts. And possibly because of the situation my institution finds itself in, I spend a lot of time with government officials lately. <laughs> and we always start talking to them and touring them in the um, cultural living room, which was funded by Art Place. And we talk about creative placemaking to them, and they don't really get it. So I too am very pleased to see that you're talking about research and talking about really embedding creative placemaking because we need to help government officials along that curve, along that trajectory, because in the end they could be incredibly helpful both in moving projects forward and in helping us fund it. And if there is a way we can start a dialogue so that we can help you help us explain to them what is going on, I think that would be a terrific um, step because not everyone is as visionary as Kip is. And I think he was in Miami last year yeah. and I heard him he speak was. then. Um, I would say he's the exception to the rule in terms of, of most government officials on the state and local levels. So if we can be advocates for creative placemaking using your power, your research, and your help, I think that would be terrific. I, I think that's hugely important work. And just so you know, there are two communities that I've been talking with, one that's going through very significant mayoral transformation um, and one that's not, that have actually asked me to come in and speak with their civic leadership because there is this, I was just talking about this, um, I think with uh, Garrett when we were talking before, there's this bizarre thing that if you hear something from a stranger, you believe it. So if there's a way that I can be the stranger in your community who comes in and validates what you already know to be true, you know, I'm happy to play that role and I think it's something that's really important for us to do. So if there are things like that, it's 100% the kind of thing that I think we need to be doing. So let me go. Hi. Uh, my name is Cynthia Chavez Lamar, and I'm with the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I just wanted to thank you for um, you for acknowledging the existence of American Indian tribes in the United States um, by referencing tribal leaders in your remarks. Um, as a person who's of Native American heritage, I'm from San Felipe Pueblo in New Mexico. Um, it's vitally important 
for us to be part of this initiative, I think, um, because our communities are very rich in arts and cultures. And, and um, I think that a lot of times our tribal leaders fail to see that um, the arts can be more than just a tourist attraction in our communities. So thank you. No, I think that's hugely important. And I was lucky enough to um, have been asked to spend a week in Alaska with a couple of people that are sitting behind you um, and was able to spend some time getting to know a couple projects that are going on, um, including the one that Rico's involved with, the um, uh, Walter Soboloff Center in Juneau, which I think is a really interesting way that that the native arts aren't just being used for tourism or for decoration, but are, I think, really in a fundamental way changing the inscription of the downtown and changing sort of the ownership of that communal space. So I think it's a really interesting area. And when I was there, um, I was there actually with one of Chris Beck's colleagues, Patrice Kunesh, um, who uh, is deputy undersecretary, I think, of USDA. And her background is Lakota. And so she and I were speaking a little bit about the um, uh, project at the Red Cloud Indian School. Um, so I just, I think there are a lot of folks who are interested in this. So I'm eager to have us be a partner in any of those conversations. So thank you for introducing yourself and saying that. Uh, I don't know, I I've lost track of my mic. So let me go here. Um, hi, I'm Gulgun Kayim from the city of Minneapolis. Um, and uh, just wanted to echo a little bit what NATO was saying over there around the importance of um, race and culture in this conversation in our communities, especially low-income communities. Uh, as a stakeholder, I consider myself, I, I'm the director of arts, culture, creative economy in the city, and I consider myself a, a stakeholder in many of the projects happening within the city and a partner to many of the projects. And um, there, are, there are two specific issues I want, I'm really interested in digging down into in this conversation, and that is what do we mean when we say economic development and for whom? And also, um, the issue of research, especially, because yes, it, you, I have met that through many of the debates around qualitative and quantitative assessment, but that, those debates are extraordinarily damaging to people like me, because I need that research mm -hmm. to work, and I need to deliver it to elected officials in a way that can ha help them make the best possible decisions for the community. So it's very hard for me to do that when I have so much opposition and I'm, I'm, I'd be very curious to hear from my colleagues in other cities how they have managed that and then what they're doing uh, in terms of uh, making that, that research field responsive to our needs. I think that's great. I know um, tomorrow at our lunch hour, we're going to sort of have a sort of do-it-yourself affinity group session. And I, so I know Golgan's interested in meeting with other folks who are sort of working in and with municipal government and having that conversation. So it might be interesting for DIA to join and, and for some other folks to do that. So I'm just watching time, Liz. We have time for, we have what? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Excellent. So we have 10 minutes worth of questions. Let me go to the woman standing here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Driggins, and I'm with the Washington, D.C. Office of Planning. And it's been a really great um, opening session, and I'm really excited to be here. I was at the uh, first conference in Miami last year, and really hearing some of the conversations, some of it's the same. And I think that some of the four areas that you're choosing to focus in, I think all of them are right on point. The one that I really want to talk about right now is broadening the field and sort of the field work, the, the, that last bullet, which is really about building the field. And as someone who's really rooted in place, um, I've been in community and economic development for the last 18 to 20 years. And so as a grantee, you know, our office really used Art Place strategically to kind of move the ball with um, arts and culture as driving neighborhood development. So in terms of being um, the, the conversation needs to be, um, and it is growing sort of outside of the field of who's in here and really sort of reaching other, um, other, uh, other arenas. And so with Liz, this year we're going to um, the American Planning Association yep. National Conference. And you know, really I go to a lot of these conferences and it's sometimes tangentially talked about, but really what Art Place is really the intersection of the two fields and where you really see that overlap, really pushing the conversation in the community development and placemaking field, I think is critical to really um, moving the national conversation of creative placemaking. So, you know, we're happy that we're gonna be 
at um, APA this year and the panel that we're gonna be moderating, Liz is actually moderating a panel with um, Kip Bergstrom, mm -hmm. with um, Michael Forsyth with, in Detroit and myself, so that's one panel. And I also think Liz is doing one on rural development. So mm -hmm. we are sort of trying to push the conversation outward and there's some other um, initiatives that we have in the works as well. And as someone who's based in Washington, I get a lot of calls from around the country about some of the work that we're doing in DC, and I think that that's good. So I encourage the grantees, especially those who are not in the arts and culture field, to really sort of have that dialogue. And we work closely with our arts <coughs> and culture community, with our Arts and Humanities Commission, as well as some of the arts organizations. But we come at it from a very specific um, point of view, and, and, I'm, I, and I'm unapologetic for that, but really understand the need for, for arts and culture and moving the, the conversation in communities around neighborhood revitalization. I think that's exactly right. And I'll, I was, I've been a Washingtonian for the past four years, and just the one thing I'll sort of say as a private citizen is very few people um, use words like visionary and innovative when it comes to DC government. But, the, <laughs> but in all seriousness, the DC Office of Planning has done some extraordinary things. And just, I was sort of bowled over just as a citizen, as a, as a resident of DC. So thrilled to sort of have you as a partner. The other thing I'll say is someone asked me a couple weeks ago what I thought the most difficult part of this job was going to be. And what I said was, the people that I really need to speak with are the people who have no interest in speaking to me. Right, if I say, would you like to speak about the arts and community development, if you raise your hand, we don't need to have the conversation because I've already made the sale. Right, it's the people who keep their hands down that I'm interested in speaking with. So that sort of notion of where do we go where the people aren't embracing it so warmly is so important. So just thank you very much for that. Yeah, hi, Michael Syrath. I'm from Seattle and with Capitol Hill Housing. We did the 12th Avenue Arts Building and a new art place funder. Um, two things, we do uh, affordable housing, community development work, and bringing affordable art space. So the comments from the gentleman at Creative Time about social equity, we're in a very rapidly gentrifying neighborhood and have a long out of strong market trouble there. Um, very great comments, and those are excellent. Um, I was excited to hear you talk more about delegates moving forward. Um, we're hungry for the conversations you're having or are uh, wanting to help push it forward. So if there's something we can do as current funders, um, to be those delegates, we happen to have a very supportive government in our city who wants more of this, they're hungry for it, so the more we can bring best practices, ideas, and you feed them to them, we'll, we'll be working to create a stronger network locally. So I, I encourage you to think about us as your delegates starting now. I totally love that, and, and just, I mean, that so perfectly sets up the session that we're about to go into, because in addition to sort of us thinking about you, I wanna ask all of you to think about us. And so the invitation is a two-way one. Also come to me and say, it would be really great if we could have a representative of a national foundation at this meeting that we're having, because we, you know, this is a pivotal watershed moment or stuff like that. So please, this is an honest invitation, sort of make it a two-way street and let us equally think about each other and what we can do, because we're all in this together and we're all sort of in the field. All right, excellent. So I'm going to do Jason and Leslie. Perfect. We'll end with friends. Hi, uh, Jason Schubach from the National Endowment for the Arts. Hi, everybody. I run the Our Town program. Um, so this is just a little bit of a statement, not really necessary. I, we are just thrilled about the new direction of Art Place, not new direction, continuing direction of Art Place, uh, especially around the field building conversation. And having worked with Jamie for almost four y years now, I have to say, this is one smart dude. And we are in <laughs> incredibly good hands here. And it is going to just be. He's going to rock it out, so it's going to be awesome. <laughs> That's all. Can we end there? <laughs> You're not going to say anything like that, so can we just end there? <laughs> I'm Leslie Cotton. I've known you for five chapters. I five think jobs, That's true. But I will not tell stories uh, involving <laughs> punk music. Um, I run Governor's Island, uh, which is a small island in New York Harbor. Uh, and I want to say one thing that's sort of obvious based on what I do and one that's less. One is sort of the role of public spaces and mm. parks. And we're completely heterodoxical in that we absolutely embrace all kinds of programming. And we like to provoke our colleagues in parks to say, like, we're really happy this grass is trashed because it's the setting for all kinds of activities. And when you think about sort of shared spaces, you know, uh, even in the mayor's remarks, streets are shared spaces public spaces, but sort of changing attitudes about those being stages for all kinds of culture, I think are important. 
um, because they're free and yeah. they're there already. Um, and <coughs> the other word that I haven't heard at all is commerce. Um, and commerce is a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. creating. We have an Etsy house on Governor's Island. Those artisans sell things that are fine with me. I don't you know, audit them. But I think as you look, as, as people walk through downtown LA and you'll see creative industry signs, office space, you'll see uh, locally owned retail, you'll see free space given to art galleries, all of those are part of the ferment. But thinking about how, where that synergy is and that commerce is not necessarily a dirty word because particularly for people under 35, creative industries, there are no, there are no boundaries anymore between what I used to call you know, commercial versus not profit versus restaurant versus museum and how we all embrace that I think becomes really important, particularly for people younger than me. Yeah. Yes, no, I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. And is Beth Nordland here? Did she make it in? Uh, Beth? Okay, okay, excellent. So I just want to make sure you and Leslie connect at some point because I sense kindred spirits. So I think you guys will have a lot to talk about. So, all right, this is, you know, just the beginning of conversation, so I don't feel too bad about drawing to a close now. Uh, and I'm going to turn things over to Liz, who's going to do a couple housekeeping notes, and then we all get to stretch our legs and, and do that sort of stuff. So, Liz Crane. Hi. Hello, I'm Liz Crane, Deputy Director of Art Place America. Um, I wanted to welcome all of you and welcome all of you who are watching via our live stream. As a reminder for everybody in this room, we are having conversations online in addition to in person. So keep an eye on the hashtag Art Place throughout the day. And if you're at home watching or if you're with a group watching, um, please interact with us um, on our Twitter feed at Art Place America or hashtag Art Place. Um, these are going to be short housekeeping, housekeeping comments. Uh, I'm going to add some more comments about what we're going to do tonight and tomorrow, uh, a little bit later today. But just to get the very basics, because this is a conference, the bathrooms are to the right. <laughs> um, if you're watching from home, I can't point to where they are, but I'm sure they're nearby. Um, uh, hopefully, you've all checked in and gotten your program um, and leafed through it to see everything that we've got coming in the next couple days. Um, if there's any issues with the hotel, please let me know. Um, I know I've been talking to many of you about that. Um, if you're watching from home um, with, with big weather and, and terrible things, we hope your internet stays going throughout this entire thing and that it stops snowing soon. And we'll try not to talk about the sunshine that's coming in Los Angeles. Um, so that's pretty much it for this first session. Um, again, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the tour tonight. It's going to be really exciting. Don't plan to go anywhere else. We're going to have a great reception later. Um, and otherwise, if you have anything else that you need, come find me, come to the registration table, and we'll take care of you. So thanks so much. We're going to have a really quick Quick break. So this is a 15 minute break. This is not a 30 minute break. This is a go stretch your legs and then come back in break. Um, and we'll have longer breaks uh, later in the session. So come back in and, and be ready to move around. There's some exciting stuff happening. So we're going to come back by 6.45 to get started. I'm sorry, 3.45. I am in Eastern time still. I'm still working that out. So 3.45, we'll see you all back in here. Thanks so much.